Okay, let's start then. Welcome everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar, which is uh, organized by the uh, technical network of FAO on sustainable food um, value chains and uh, rural finance. And uh, you know, this is a technical network, one of the technical networks of, the, of FAO, and uh, it's a platform for exchanging ideas. It's a, it's a place for sharing documents, uh, sharing information uh, about whatever relates to food systems, food value chains, and uh, rural finance. Uh, the technical, as uh, among other activities, uh, knowledge generation and dissemination through webinars, and this is one of them actually. So today we have the pleasure of uh, having a GSMA with us. I guess most of you know that GSMA is the global system for um, mobile communication. And uh, so uh, today we have two presenters, Panos and Sonia, who will talk about uh, the digitization for procurement activities and, and access to finance, so the link between the two. So the subject for today is transforming farmers' access to finance through digital agriculture. That's something that's, I guess, uh, very interesting and very um, uh, something we are all looking at uh, due to its relevance. So I'll just uh, give some uh, rules of the house as usual. Please keep yourself muted during the presentation, make sure that you are muted so there is no background noises. Um, uh, if you have during the presentation any question or comment that you want to make, feel free to post them on the chat. Uh, we'll be looking at them and uh, taking note in case of questions to be posed during the Q&A session. You can also uh, post the question yourself if you want. That will happen during the, the Q&A session. Uh, as regards the agenda, the presentation by Panos and Sonia will last more or less 30 minutes approximately. Then we'll have our discussion and, and then we'll close. Um, without further ado at this point, I'd like to give the floor to, to Panos to introduce himself, to introduce GSMA and to introduce us to this very interesting subject. Thank you very much. To you, Panos. Many thanks, Massimo and uh, Melissa, and a warm welcome to our audience today. Uh, my name is Panos Lukos. I'm Acting Insights Director at the GSMA Agritech Program. I am joined today by my colleague, Sonia Piedosi, um, who's Insights Manager at the Agritech Program, and we're both very excited to present at FAO's webinar series and discuss about the link between use of digital agriculture and promoting farmers' financial inclusion. Now, before we um, start with our content in the next slides, um, I want to acknowledge the Agritech uh, program donors. Um, the material that we are presenting today has been funded by uh, UK Aid from UK's Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, the FCDO, and is supported by GSMA and its members. Moving to the next slide, just to look at the agenda for today. Um, we will start with, the, um, with a few words about GSMA and the Agritech program. And after that, Sonia and I will discuss the role of digital agriculture um, in addressing pain points faced by farmers and other actors in the agriculture ecosystem. And uh, we will make the connection between digital agriculture and promoting farmers' financial inclusion. We will then very briefly look at the use of digital agriculture uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, before we move to the Q&A session. Uh, and before closing today's webinar, we will just spend a few minutes to present the key conclusions um, from today's presentation and also to direct you to a set of relevant GSMA publications uh, that are publicly um, accessible on the GSMA Agritech program webpage. Um, anytime, please feel free to share your questions in the chat box. Um, Sonia and I will do our utmost to uh, answer your questions at the very end during the Q&A session. And any question that we may not be able to um, address today, we'll be more than happy to cover um, 
via an email or maybe to connect at the later point um, in the next few days. Uh, moving to the next slides, let me share a few things about the GSMA and the Agritech program. Uh, first with the GSMA. The GSMA is the Global Trade Association of the Mobile Industry. Members of the GSMA are over 750 mobile operators and some 400, 400 companies operating in the broader mobile ecosystem. Uh, GSMA is known for its events. Um, mobile World Congress in Barcelona uh, is one of the most well-known events of the GSMA, uh, exceptionally for this year taking place in the last week of June. But GSMA also um, runs <coughs> more specialized events, uh, such as Mobile 360 events, um, which is happening uh, regionally, and other topic-specific events. Within the GSMA, there is a um, not-for-profit unit uh, of the organization, which is called Mobile for Development. And Mobile for Development is positioned at the intersection of the mobile ecosystem and the development sector to stimulate digital innovation and deliver both sustainable business models and large-scale socioeconomic impacts uh, for the underserved. The work that Mobile for Development does is funded by donors. Uh, within Mobile for Development, there is a number of programs, and the Agritech program is one of these programs, uh, but there is also a wide variety of other programs as well. And for example, we have the Mobile Money program, the uh, Mobile for Humanitarian program, um, the Connected Women program, and so on. Uh, specifically for the Agritech program, uh, the work that the program does is funded by UK's FCDO, um, the UK government. We also receive funding from Australia's DFAT, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, we've had funding recently, very recently, from the Inter-American Development Bank, and we're about to actually announce a new initiative from funding uh, with funding from new donors, um, which is uh, going to become go public very, very soon. Um, the vision of the program is to support equitable and sustainable food chains that empower farmers and strengthen local economies. In a humanitarian and crisis, so we had to put that because... Yeah, can I ask, thanks, can I ask everybody to mute your mic? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so to deliver on the vision of the program, um, we bring together and support the mobile industry agricultural sector stakeholders, such as agribusinesses and cooperatives, innovators, such as agritech organizations and investors operating in the agritech space uh, to launch, improve and scale impactful and commercially sustainable digital agriculture solutions for farmers. And the farmer that we have um, in our focus uh, is the very the farmer at the very bottom of the pyramid, the farmer who lives in less than two dollars per day. Um, to deliver on the vision that I mentioned just now, um, we are engaged in a number of activities you, that you can see on the right hand side of this slide in the circles. Um, through our research and insights work, we inform the donor and investor communities, um, as well as the service providers themselves, mobile operators or agri organizations, on the operational and business models that have the highest potential for success, commercial sustainability, and socioeconomic impact. And we produce a lot of um, a vast body of insights, and we publish all this as a public good on our website. So um, we will mention some of this at the very end of today's webinar, but there is a lot more available on in the resources page of the GSMA Agritech program. And another important part of our work is innovation funds and technical assistance. Uh, by providing funding uh, to organizations uh, to and technical assistance to them, we support scalable and commercially viable models. And um, we, um, aim to uh, support and deliver benefits uh, to oh, the sector stakeholders, including oh, farmers, of course. And naturally, we also facilitate partnerships and synergies and 
um, collaborations between those different parties that I just mentioned. Um, now in the next slide, and I'm just gonna start now um, framing and kind of contextualizing the topic of today's discussion. Um, I want to spend maybe a minute or two to discuss the focus areas of the Agritech program. Our first area of focus is the digitization of the agricultural last mile. Now, the agricultural last mile is the point of intersection between those who produce the crops, the farmers, and those who buy the crops, the agribusinesses or cooperatives. In that last mile, there are many systems and processes that take place. And our work focuses on facilitating the transition uh, from paper or analog systems to digital technologies in, the, in this uh, space, in the last mile of food supply chains. Specifically, we work on developing digital solutions that can um, benefit both farmers and other value chain actors, can create transparency, allow better monitoring and visibility in supply chains. The second area of focus is that of climate resilience. We are working on testing and scaling models um, that use mobile data or other sources of data such as, such as satellite data and to deliver um, various services to farmers and improve their climate resilience. Services such as insurance products to farmers like uh, weather index insurance products or other services such as even basic weather forecasting or uh, agromed services, um, specialized agronomic advice based on uh, weather. And the third area of focus is that of financial inclusion of smallholder farmers. And in a later slide, I'm just going to actually um, discuss and um, show to you how we actually, um, at, at a, um, how we um, um, approach the topic and what is the connection, the link between digital agriculture and financial inclusion of farmers. I mentioned a couple of slides earlier that we are engaged in um, uh, innovation funds. And in this slide, you can actually see information on our portfolio of grantees from our current innovation fund for the digitization of agricultural value chains. So this is a fund that we launched in 2019 with funding from um, then DFID, now UK's FCDO. Um, the fund aims to scale digital solutions for the agricultural last mile, such as those that digitize farm and farmer records and enable the transition from cash payments to mobile money enabled, payment, enabled payments for farmers. And this is massively important. And we will explain in a bit why. Through this work, we aim to improve the financial inclusion of farmers and also allow the farmers to produce more, higher yields of better quality, increase their profits, and improve their livelihoods, while at the same time improving their climate resilience. This is a global fund. Uh, we have allocated grants of um, 220,000 pounds to seven organizations, four of them operating in Sub-Saharan Africa, two in South Asia and one in Southeast Asia. Um, these grants um, will last for a period of about 24 months. Um, and together with the financial support, GSMA offers to those organizations technical assistance. Um, we offer in-kind support in areas such as user-centric design, um, monitoring and evaluation studies, business intelligence, and so on. Now, after this introduction that contextualizes today's discussion, I would like to move to um, slide number nine. Um, and talk more about the specific topic. In agriculture of value chains, um, commodity sourcing happens in the last mile we mentioned earlier. And that is where the buyers of the crops interact with the producers of the crops. And traditionally value chain actors, farmers, agribusinesses, cooperatives, um, they face significant number of inefficiencies and bottlenecks that increase the cost of production, um, do not allow for clarity, visibility, transparency in the supply chains, but they also have a direct impact on farmers. And that direct impact on farmers, as a result of that impact, farmers are stopped or 
do not are not able to access financial products of ser or services remain unbanked and exhibit a low degree of financial inclusion. Handling procurement on paper and in cash increases the risk of thefts and frauds, and that affects both farmers as well as agribusinesses. Um, and also takes away um, transparency and clarity that is necessary for all parties in agricultural value chains. And that becomes even more important these days with the ever increasing demand for traceability that is coming from consumers, especially those in more developed markets. Under these circumstances, it becomes very difficult for farmers to achieve a living income, it becomes difficult for them to save enough. And um, basically it uh, creates a need for farmers to reach out to organizations, usually formal organizations, uh, to request credit and uh, use that credit to invest in their farms. Um, the situation becomes even more complicated when we have crops with an irregular cash flow across the year. Um, farmers require, fin require financing and they usually ask or request financing from informal or formal um, sources. However, farmers very often do not have uh, the ability to access financing because they lack economic identities. So what is an economic identity? These economic identities basically consist of farm and farmer data that allow organizations operating in the form of financial systems, such as banks and MFIs, microfinancing institutions, to assess the credit worthiness of the farmers and offer them access to credit and savings products or even other products, such as insurance products. Um, and basically for them, the banks, um, having access to those economic identities allows them to see how feasible it is for the farmer to repay the loan and for them to minimize the risk. Um, if we move to the next slide, digital technologies allow agricultural stakeholders to mitigate some of the risks and the pain points they face in the procurement of crops. And in this slide, um, you can see uh, specifically business challenges that affect the dissemination of information or maybe the payments of the farmers for the procurement of crops um, or the profiling of the farmers when recruitment of farmers happen at the start of the season and so on. Digital procurement solutions refer to the use of digital technologies across any of these particular processes. And uh, digital procurement systems, systems may involve a mix of digital technologies and interfa interfaces. For example, it might uh, be that digital procurement solutions involve a mobile application, a cloud uh, service um, for storage of data, a web interface. Uh, they may integrate an ERP system. Um, they may use SMS or USSD for dissemination of information or maybe integrating mobile money uh, for payment of farmers for the procurement of crops. So there is a number of different digital technologies that can play a role in supporting the development of a digital procurement system that can address specific pain points that farmers and other agricultural sector stakeholders are facing. For agribusinesses, digital technologies can help to make production more transparent, allow agribusinesses to better monitor the operations. Um, and for farmers, they create transparency and clearer terms of trades, uh, but they also allow farmers to onboard on the pathway to financial inclusion. And how is this done? Um, if we move to the next slide, um, Digital procurement solutions um, used by agribusinesses in the procurement of crops capture a wealth of farm and farmer data. Um, for example, data that identify the farmer, who the farmer is, what is their telephone number, how big is their family, what is the location of the farm, and so on. 
data about farming activities, such as um, the type of agri-extension support that has been offered to that farmer in the previous season, or the types of fertilizers and pesticides that that farmer has used in the previous season, um, as well as other information about that farmer. When a digital procurement tool integrates mobile money um, that can be used for paying those farmers instead of cash, then the procurement tool generates a lot of transactional logs as well. These records, in combination with other farm and farmer data, can support the development of economic identities for those farmers, which is actually what was missing previously to allow those farmers to access credit and savings products from the formal financial sector. Those economic identities from the digital procurement tool, when shared with the bank in a secure way and following consent from the farmer, can allow those financial institutions to assess the credit worthiness of the farmer and extend to them customized credit products um, or maybe savings products that specifically address the needs of those farmers. You can see in this slide that cash in is actually um, the kind of first step in this process. Um, the cash inflows, uh, and the cash inflows are coming from the procurement payment to the farmer. So this is the entry point. And um, following that point, um, farmers can engage as they start building trust to the digital system, can engage in more transactions, such as P2P payments, or maybe bill payments, and so on. And slowly, more and more data is generated, which can support the development of a more holistic economic identity for a farmer and a better assessment of the farmer's credit worthiness and extending financial services and products to them. Uh, Sonia will now take over and will uh, share even more information on the topic by taking a deep dive onto specific um, um, areas around extending financial products and services to farmers. Thank you, Panos. Um, Indeed, as Panos was telling us, all the different uh, digital agricultural tools and solutions that help address specific business challenges and pain points along the value chain. At the same time, they also uh, produce data and digitize a number of information that otherwise would be very costly and difficult to, to collect and especially to, to validate. Uh, for, for instance, financial service providers who would like to extend finance to farmers. From a, the perspective of these financial institutions, what kind of data do they normally need to conduct this type of assessments? We are really talking about uh, at least three categories of uh, data, uh, those that can give us the profile uh, of farmer and really respond to the know your customer um, regulation in each country. Um, other data that can give us information on the sources of income and therefore estimate the ability to repay our farmers. And then those that can help in loss mitigation and therefore also start um, replacing the need for potential collateral. Indeed, when we talk about these data-driven credit products, usually we're talking about um, unsecure products, so products that do not need collateral. And indeed, the data that digital agricultural tools produce can um, support the financial institutions to have better visibility on each category of this type of data. For instance, um, through digital procurement, as the example that we use until now, we're looking into digitizing farmers' profiles. So from having, starting from the borrower's name and the national ID, that can then be verified if there is a national ID system the mobile number and then can open for um, data with the mobile network operator, for instance, and mobile usage and smartphone ownership or even the size of the household, but also then farm activities and information, the size of the land, the ownership of the land as well, but also the mix of crops, for instance, to see also um, what kind of cycles need to be, crop cycles need to be uh, taken into consideration uh, for that specific farmer. Uh, and also we're talking about uh, use of 
uh, for instance, through digital advisory service, right? The use of proper uh, agricultural practices or use of um, uh, machineries and renting equipment and things like that. that could give a sense of how mature is the farmer's knowledge uh, of, the, of the operations uh, and therefore a, bit, a sense of the risk that we're actually taking in financing its, its operation and agricultural activities. Another use for data is yes, to um, assess credit worthiness, but then also to design uh, a credit product or even a saving product in a way that uh, really matches the needs and preferences of farmers. As we know, depending on value chains, farmers have different crop cycles and therefore different cash inflows and outflows. Um, and so it's very important to take this information into consideration uh, when uh, designing a product so to maximize them, the, their ability to repay. So it's not only uh, estimating their credit worthiness, but also then uh, do the, the, the best that we can to really uh, facilitate then the repayment process. Um, and then in, in the usage of this data to really maximize the opportunity to use this data and then serve farmers, we see a number of models emerging that always require the participation and sharing of data between partners. There is not only one partner that has only one stakeholder that has all the different uh, characteristics and capabilities required in this process. Uh, for instance, at the data collection stage, typically agribusinesses or agrotechs are closer to the farmers, so in a better position to actually collect and digitize the data. And also, for instance, collect consent uh, from the farmer and also use all the data privacy, let's say, um, uh, checks uh, have to be in place. Then when we start moving towards data aggregation and data analysis that are really required uh, to use the data, uh, we see that agri-tech, so even financial service provider might be better placed uh, in this, at this stage. I have to say that um, financial service providers that are indeed very interested in using digital tools and target farmers are starting to equip themselves to be able to um, fulfill these steps. Uh, in other cases, uh, some FSPs are not really used to use data in this way. So that's where agri-techs or fintechs indeed can, can help in the aggregation of data from different sources. Because we talked about digital procurement until now, but uh, as uh, um, Panos mentioned at the beginning, there are other sources of data. For instance, the smart farming, we're talking about sensors, uh, satellites, uh, drones, etc., that give us further information on um, what the uh, farmers are doing and how they're managing their farming activities. And then as I was saying, these are important indicators in terms of risk mitigation. So agritex can aggregate data from different sources and then also analyze them with proper business intelligence tools. But definitely the last step when we talk about risk modeling and credit scoring, usually financial service providers do have those capabilities or anyway prefer to have their credit scoring system in-house to really fully understand the implications of the risks that they are taking. Since at the end of the day, they are always responsible uh, for the non-performing loans or for customer protection issues, et cetera, and towards the, the regulator. So ultimately it's, it's their responsibility. Uh, so indeed we talked about uh, digital procurement data, how we can have economic identities and how we can leverage this economic identities for credit uh, risk assessment and um, credit uh, um, product design and what kind of partnership models are we, so we've seen emerging in this space. And now we can talk quickly about uh, the use of digital agricultural tools during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we see how digital agricultural tools really helped during this crisis, food systems become more resilient in the face of, of the pandemic. Um, as we said, um, as we already hinted through the presentation, digital procurement is only one of several use cases in a very digital cultural landscape. Uh, our program, Jesimi Agritech, has categorized these digital agricultural tools in uh, three macro uh, categories, depending on the uh, challenge and the service they're providing um, to the farmers, to the challenge that they are addressing. 
Um, and these are under, for instance, access to service. We talk about digital advisory, and these are really information tools uh, that provide information to farmers about uh, uh, agronomic activities, but also about weather or pests and diseases and how to deal with them, but also about, for instance, market prices and how to access, access markets. And also under access to services, we have the agricultural digital financial services. And here we are talking about from payments to savings, credit and loans and insurance products, as well as um, solutions, for instance, like credit scoring models, credit scoring solutions that can enable access of farmers to uh, digital financial services. Uh, in terms of access to markets, we're looking into digital procurement that we've already discussed, so that increases the transparency uh, and, and um, digitize all the transactions between farmers and buyers, but also agri-commerce solutions. So, so these platforms that allow to sell the product or buy inputs directly uh, from, you know, shortening the value chain. So they're putting in direct contact the farmer with the, with the supplier on a, on a live platform. And finally, in terms of access to assets, as I mentioned before, smart farming solutions that really leverage uh, IoT, Internet of Things, to uh, help understand um, and manage the agricultural activities and help understand how well farmers are doing. For instance, to help manage water systems or, or the like. As you can see here, that we made a direct connection between the type of them uh, challenges that each one helps addressing. As you can imagine, and like you mentioned knowledge gaps, financial exclusion, but especially low productivity and climate resilience as well. And what we noticed during the pandemic uh, is that uh, um, smallholder farmers uh, really struggled due to the measures that have been put in place uh, to um, uh, contain the, the COVID-19 spread. Uh, at each stage, so land preparation, cultivation, and storage, uh, farmers really struggled uh, to, for instance, uh, acquire inputs due to the travel restriction put in place. So inputs could not I go from urban settings to rural settings and actually reach the farmers. And when these happen, the few inputs available, of course, they were more expensive uh, than normal. So here there is also then a need of financing that is not met, additional financing. Also because usually when we don't have digital solutions available, MFIs or financial service providers, banks, really I need to go to the rural areas to conduct their validations. And this was, of course, not possible. Um, we also saw, for instance, that how social distancing and curfews and safety measures reduce the availability of um, laborers to conduct exactly during uh, the cultivation stage to conduct the labor, um, or when it was available, once again, it was more expensive than usual. Also, travel restrictions uh, limited the availability of extension services, so farmers could not have that knowledge support anymore. And finally, in terms of the access to market, we see closure of local markets and, and at the same time, challenges in transporting produce to farther markets or even, for instance, for exporting. So uh, challenges in all different levels. And with the challenges I, I mentioned, uh, my camera is not a surprise as we see that digital advisory, agricultural digital financial services and agri-commerce have actually emerged as the three most sought after digital tools uh, during the pandemic. So for instance, um, as lockdowns and limits on in-person gatherings have shifted advisory from in-person to online uh, tools, so we saw several agri-techs and agribusinesses including or using the normal communication channels, not only to provide agricultural advice, but to provide also health advice and communicate and spread the measures to contain COVID-19. So we saw this, this type of adjustments. In terms of agricultural digital financial services, we see an acceleration of the use of uh, mobile money, for instance, among small of the fine farmers. Sorry. We see an increase of 400%, for instance, in Rwanda in the weekly number of transactions in March and April 2020. So immediately, um, as soon as the, the, the measures started to be put in place. And also we see how uh, agricultural companies are using data collected from uh, small of the finance, exactly leveraging this data for credit risk assessments to try to mitigate 
the necessity to go into rural settings to collect these data from uh, agricultural financial service providers. And in terms of uh, agri-e-commerce, uh, this solution indeed managed to give an access to market for smallholder farmers, but especially we saw a change of um, business models. Uh, before many of these solutions put farmers in touch with other businesses like supermarkets or retailers, um, and, uh, and, but as these uh, businesses started to close, um, so these um, solutions that change the business models and put the user directly in touch with their customers so trying really to mitigate losses on both sides. So these are some of the findings that we um, came up with in our, in our report that will soon be published uh, on COVID-19 accelerating the use of the digital agricultural tools um, that's in, in the next couple of weeks. And now we are ready to have some Q&A. So um, I'll let Panos and Massimo let us know if there are some questions. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Sonia, and, thank, and thanks, Panos. I, I'll ask Panos to start maybe replying to one of the questions that appeared on the chats on the uh, long-term crops like trees. Go ahead, Panos. Thank you, Massimo. Uh, that, that's a very interesting question, um, and it actually um, shows how digital agriculture can play an even more important role in perennial crops, and I will explain why in a minute. That doesn't, of course, mean that um, annual crops cannot benefit, on the contrary, but even more so in the case of perennial crops. So a farmer might have a farm, um, in this case a tree farm, or let's say it's a cocoa farm to kind of make it a bit more relevant, let's say to West Africa or a tea uh, farm. And um, it takes some time for uh, trees or the crop, the plants to mature. Um, during that period of time, uh, the farmer is actually involved in negative cash flows, which means that the farmer carries on spending money on looking after the trees or maybe uh, uh, buying more stock or uh, using pesticides and fertilizers to get them to the maturity stage at which stage the tree or the farm is going to start producing the crop for which it was cultivated. Um, for example, in the case of cocoa, it takes a number of years for a cocoa plant to actually um, become mature and start harvesting. And the same applies to a typical um, tree farm that was actually asked in the question. For that farmer, it is crucial to be able um, to carry on financing their operations and um, having access to the right credit solutions that will allow them to, um, for example, um, replace some of the trees, the trees that may be aging or buy some more higher value, higher value items or higher value expenses that are required for the looking after of that farm. And um, of course, for access to finance, uh, the farmer can actually go to informal sources and that might be people in the community, the family, often unlikely for them to have enough savings to support this farmer, especially with high value items. Um, it, you know, for example, replacing aging trees is a very expensive process and it takes a lot of time to um, get some sort of repayment back. Uh, as you mentioned, that uh, maturity comes several years later. So that is why digitization of agriculture and making the connection between that digitization and the um, promotion of farmers' financial inclusion becomes even more relevant because those farmers are in even greater need to have access to credit and savings products uh, to be able to buy those items, those high value items, or even if we forget about agricultural activities, to be able to sustain themselves and um, cover expenses, expenses that the farmer faces on a, in their day-to-day -day life, like we do, um, like healthcare expenses or maybe um, education expenses uh, or even expenses, household expenses and so on. So even more so in perennial crops, this need is actually there. This needs to identify sustainable sources of financing for farmers and allow those farmers, previously unbanked farmers, to gain access 
to customize ser products and services um, that um, are aligned with the crop life cycle. Uh, to offer those farmers a typical credit product like the one that I can get here in the UK, that would not help them because the farmer will not start receiving any income from their crops for a significant amount of time. It is important for those farmers to be able to access customized products that will take into consideration the new crop life cycle and the maturity of the crop. And basically I'm referring to the cash inflows and outflows uh, so that they will have the best chances of um, repaying that loan in the future. Great. Thanks, Panos. What a comprehensive uh, answer. Thank you very much. We have a couple of additional questions from the chat. One is from Pedro, who is asking whether do you see digital solutions evolving around one-stop shops to be supported or by supporting a constellation of startups? That's one. Let me read you the following one so you can uh, reply to both. Uh, this is from Benoist. And he's asking if you have practices to share of uh, fragile, conflict-affected and vulnerable countries where access to finance markets and all kinds of these services is even more challenging. To you, Panos. Thank you, Massimo. Um, so let me uh, start with the first question of Pedro. Um, if we have seen examples of one-stop shops, so this is, a, again, a very relevant question. So earlier on, I was talking about the various um, types of digital solutions that fall under digital procurement. And we mentioned that um, based on the segmentation by the GSMA, we have six different types. One is looking after information dissemination. One is about mobile payments to farmers. One is about uh, profiling of those farmers and so on. There are agri-tech organizations out there, innovators, who are actually looking and addressing the specific needs of one particular area only. And that is absolutely fine. For example, a mobile operator in West Africa, in Ghana, for example, um, has a mobile money service as a standalone or a kind of um, standard offering of the, in their product portfolio. And although a mobile money uh, provider is not the typical agritech you would have in mind, but in real terms, they can actually address that need that the agribusiness and the farmer is facing when it comes to uh, payments of the farmers. However, um, that might not be enough. And signi a significant number of agritech organizations, innovators is actually emerging that address multiple areas at one time. So there might be a solution, and I will mention a name here. I hope I'm not, uh, you know, um, um, uh, it's not taken as a promotion of a service or a product because it's not meant as such, but organizations such as FarmForce or SourceTrace, they operate platforms, digital platforms that are able to um, digitize the collection of farm and farmer data for profiling of the farmers. Uh, they integrate mobile money, which means that they can actually uh, make payments directly to the farmers through the digital solution. They offer SMS or USSD functionality that allows them to uh, share alerts with the farmers or send information to the farmers through those push channels. So they integrate a number of different functionalities and they are becoming a one-stop shop that allows um, addressing multiple challenges at the same time from a single solution. And I think that is where we're going to, and several organizations are already doing that, especially organizations that have um, reached, reached some level of maturity and um, are um, you know, present in more markets and having more clients across regions and countries. Um, now, the next question, I was wondering whether you have any, uh, Sonia, I was wondering whether you have any specific example from any of the markets um, that we have researched with, researched with um, um, you know, um, information about credit and savings products, markets that are um, more fragile than others. We don't have any particular research done specifically for FCB markets. However, many of the markets that we um, 
cover with our research uh, do fall under this, if you like, categorization. Uh, so Sonia might have some examples from there. If not, please let me know and I can answer that question. Actually, Panos, I was uh, thinking about uh, Myanmar, which I, I would think it would fall under this categorization, definitely, isn't it? We, we studied the market, actually Panos studied the market beginning of last year, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. And you can see how Myanmar, when it was a more stable a digital um, tools uh, were, um, let's say, booming, uh, the, the spread of smartphones uh, and use of digital solutions, for instance, during my research, I was talking with the World Bank has been supporting BRAC to start exactly uh, experimenting with credit scoring using these uh, tools in, in Myanmar. Uh, in that case, um, we're talking about six month cycles that were working, if I'm not mistaken, uh, around maize and this type of crops. Um, and at the third cycle, when they were going to uh, collect data, um, the COVID-19 hit. But more recently, we were actually reading about solutions that are experimenting challenges um, with the access of the uh, internet. Apparently, this uh, security law at the moment is drafted and might not you know, come in, 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 uh, yeah, into life uh, because of the current political situation. Um, so indeed, um, some of the countries where we're working uh, are also affected by uh, these uh, um, by also we yeah, have conflict uh, and this type of problems. So, and the North Panos, you, you know, in the Myanmar context quite well, if you want to say some more about that. Yeah, um, it, maybe I should mention that there is another program within the GSMA, which is called the Mobile for Humanitarian uh, Program. Um, and it is also looking at how um, digital, digital solutions um, can support populations living in markets or in countries of this type. That doesn't necessarily only restrict into um, farmers. Uh, so we are actually talking about digital solutions that are, um, um, you know, uh, suited or um, available to the general population uh, that is uh, facing humanitarian problems and so on. But there is certainly an opportunity to also support digital agricultural solutions for farmers um, in um, uh, FCV markets, fragile, conflict-affected and vulnerable markets. Um, and we've seen that in the case of Myanmar, um, but, and maybe I should also mention that there is a report, a state of the sector report that we published last September, and the name of that is Digital Agriculture Maps. And in that report, we are offering mapping a landscape analysis of digital agriculture solutions globally. And you can see there um, examples of solutions that are available to certain markets, including um, FCV markets. And I think that's a great starting point to kind of understand that digital agriculture is not just for farmers in Africa. It is not just for um, farmers um, who um, live at um, less than $2 a day. This is the key kind of focus uh, group of farmers for us, but even farmers in a bit in more developed markets, um, it is often the case that those farmers are, um, you know, uh, affected by the same challenges as other farmers. However, um, the general GDP per capita of those countries does not um, allow one to uh, understand the real complexities of value chains and the real problems that those farmers are facing. Only recently I was actually talking about, um, maybe I should say that and then stop for the next question, but only recently I was actually um, talking to stakeholders in Latin America and um, we were actually looking at the level of financial inclusion in Nicaragua versus uh, Ghana in real PPP terms. GDP per capita, sorry, not financial inclusion, the GDP per capita. And um, the GDP per capita in Nicaragua is slightly higher than that of Ghana. However, the rate of financial inclusion in Nicaragua is significantly lower than that of Ghana. So one would think that farmers in Nicaragua are better off, they have um, better conditions, they have access to more assets and services, 
Um, they are not affected in the same way farmers in Ghana are affected. However, thanks to mobile money in Ghana, more farmers have access to financial services and products um, enabled by mobile money than other farmers in Nicaragua. So um, the FCV markets are very important. However, um, I think that one can identify pain points and vulnerabilities even in markets that um, are not FCV markets or markets that you would not expect to find problems in previously. Okay, uh, thanks Panos. We have seven minutes. I hope we can go a bit farther because we have one question from Henry, from Henry very relevant, which I think you have already read and you replied to. I'd like also to read the other questions came in from uh, Jim because they're also very relevant. And Martha raised her hand. Let's see if we manage at least to reply to the first two and then reply to Martha. So the one from Henry, uh, you read it. It's about uh, the, um, you know, the fact that the GSMA decided not to invest anymore on digital services for small scale farmers. And, and so if there are any plans from GSMA to invest in uh, in foundational services. The other one is th those from Jim. I want to read them because they're very um, relevant, as I was saying. One is about if uh, some farmers already have negative scoring ratings, then this would risk to increase the exclusion, right? The financial exclusion. And I would add also, if they don't have devices with them or if they cannot use the devices, that's the risk of increasing um, the digital gap and the financial gap. And then what mechanism for sharing data between finance providers uh, to support not applications or overloading of loans? Let's skip to this now. Thanks, Panos. Thank you, Massimo. Maybe I can ask the, I can answer the first one um, and the first question of the second set of questions, and then Sonia can answer the second uh, one from the second set of questions about the sharing data mechanisms. So let me go to the first one. Um, GSMA, the agritech program, is all about supporting smallholder farmers, those at the very bottom of the pyramid, living on less than $2 per day. And we do that through funding from uh, donors, as I mentioned earlier, UK's FCDO, Australia's um, DFAT. So we are actually investing donor money and we are supporting the organizations receiving this money through technical assistance and other services in kind support to deliver and de design and deliver those services, digital agriculture solutions that are enabled by mobile technologies, by SMS, by USSD, and all these different types of technologies. So we are very much investing. Um, and supporting smallholder farmers at scale um, only in the previous um, iteration of the um, program, of the Agritech program of the GSMA, that was called the M Nutrition Initiative, and you, you can find more information on that on the website. Uh, we supported farmers with digital advisory services, consumer to farmer, and business to consumer, sorry, digital advisory services, and we reached more than 12 million farmers. So that's a huge number of farmers benefiting from digital solutions. Now, the first part of the question by Jim um, about the risks. Um, the um, marginal, uh, yeah, so, um, what is key to mention here is that it is important to um, go to farmers with a value proposition that um, includes very specialized customized products for them. So a farmer that has access to a standalone of the shelf credit uh, loan product from a bank will probably end up um, defaulting on that uh, product. So we want to actually create the right conditions for that farmer to be able to repay that loan, create enough history, repayment history, and be able to better access more products in the future. And through the seven pr uh, services that we're supporting with the innovation fund we're running currently with um, FCDO support, um, we are um, supporting those farmers by doing a lot of user experience work to understand the real needs of the farmers and looking at the crop life cycle and understanding at what point in that life cycle does this farmer has positive cash flows that will allow them to repay the loan. And while this is happening, we also disseminate information to the farmers, agronomic advice, weather information and so on, to allow those farmers to um, have access to the best um, um, uh, good agricultural practices 
and produce more crops of a better quality and increase their chances of repaying that loan. So it is important to take this into account because you're right. If we go to those farmers with a very standalone kind of uncustomized product, it is likely that those farmers are going to default. We're also talking about what kind of farmer can we first um, target with our work. And the farmers that operate in more formal value chains um, where exporters of crops buy crops and um, sell them to other markets, other global markets, value chains where traceability or sustainability are more important, these value chains have more chances of um, uh, accepting or increasing the adoption of digital agriculture tools. And the farmers that operate there might offer a better first step towards um, realizing the potential of digital agriculture to promote the financial inclusion of those farmers. And just because those farmers operate in those formal value chains, that doesn't mean that those farmers are better off or are well off. They're not. Those farmers are facing the same challenges as other farmers, maybe not to the same degree, but there are still farmers living in less than $2 per day, operating in formal value chains and selling, for example, cocoa or coffee or tea to big ag ag agribusinesses exporting crops uh, to global markets. Sorry, I'm just going to stop here and ask Sonia to actually answer the last question. We only have a couple of minutes left, so. Yeah, I also, sorry, wanted to add the importance of bundling services. We also see an increasing number of services that are bundling insurance, for instance, whether index insurance, and things like that, exactly risk mitigation type of uh, services that will help, for instance, improve scores uh, of the farmers. And the other thing also I wanted to add, uh, Massimo, to your question about what if the farmer doesn't have access to digital. And that is why, as I was saying before, leveraging the um, key skill set and assets of the different farmers. That is why we see agribusinesses with their already field agents. You know, sometimes they have tablets and therefore collect the data for farmers and many farmers don't even need to have uh, to access digital solutions or digital tools by themselves. Um, and we also saw different other types of um, solutions that can go around exactly this problem. Even agri-techs nowadays are creating their own field force exactly to overcome this problem. Um, in terms of ways for uh, was, uh, yeah, data sharing, um, this is definitely, I, I think you're we referring to uh, issues with like credit bureaus and, and, and the like, and uh, indeed, um, I think that's why also uh, all the organizations that uh, um, offer financial services need to be regulated. We see a lot of agri-techs and fintechs that are currently experimenting with this type of solution, but definitely once they reach a certain scale, uh, they need to acquire a license and start reporting uh, their loans as well. Of course, in countries where, I'm, I'm aware of countries where credit bureaus are not available, uh, this definitely needs to, be, needs to be addressed in other ways, but yeah. Regulators are definitely there and looking into this. Okay, thanks, Sonia. Thanks, Panos. Unfortunately, we have already uh, reached uh, our time limit, so I can't allow Martha to pose her question. And there were another couple of questions, one from Alphonse on access to market to help succeed in repayment of the loan. There was another one from Zhang which was close to the thing of privacy and utilization of data. I would invite you all to write to both Panos and Sonia at this uh, contacts that you see here for continuing this super interesting discussion. I would have had at least other five questions to pose, but there, there's not enough time. Um, I'll take the chance to thank you all very much, thanking uh, specifically Panos and Sonia for their time and for this uh, very interesting information. And uh, I hope they will share with us the publication as soon as it's uh, uh, available so we can share it with our network. And uh, again, feel free to uh, connect uh, and, and to write to uh, the, the technical network, so to me and to Militza, and, uh, and also to, to, to Sonia and Panos for uh, going, farther in, going farther in this, uh, in this uh, uh, topic, which is super interesting. Uh, uh, thank you very much all. I would like to ask Milica also to post on the chat the uh, contacts for the technical network so everybody can see it. Those who have not joined the network yet, please, uh, please do. You'll, uh, you'll, uh, you'll have the chance to uh, attend many other 
um, webinars like this. Uh, thank you very much again, everybody, for joining us today. And I hope I'll see you again at the next uh, webinar we'll organize. Thanks so much, Panos uh, and Sonia. And thanks, Milica, for helping organizing this. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.